Welcome everyone. Tonight it's fun time at the Vice. And guess what? I'm going to be tying some humpies. I really like tying those darn things. It's uh, one of the things that I do as a way to relax. Crazy way to relax. You know, there's some rules and materials and skills in, on, in humpies. And uh, we're going to share them with you tonight. Two of the rules are two turns and 70-30. So what do they have to do with anything? Well, we'll get to that in a few moments. But for now, we're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho. And welcome. Now I'm going to go to the recipe really quick so you can kind of get an idea what we will be working from. Uh, it's from this book, the Humpy Encyclopedia. And in it, there's 15 ways to tie a humpy. And, and if you haven't already got it, you can go to the website and get it for free on a, on a download. Of course, the book, a hard copy is going to cost you. And that'll be on Amazon or you can get those from us. But anyway, let's um, take a look at the recipe. Now, this is a generic company. There's so many different ways to do one. I just decided to put down some materials because we're going to talk at length tonight about the materials. Number one, obviously, it's a dry fly that we're tying. We're going to be using a dry fly hook. Size is 20 to 8. Sometimes bigger, sometimes a little smaller, but that's the normal range with probably the bulk of them in the 12 to 16 range. Uh, thread. We use floss 8-12 and thread 14-20. Now, what do you think those numbers mean? Well, it's just a way of telling you that we use floss to more quickly tie the larger flies and we use thread on the smaller. And as you'll find out when we get down to the head, we put thread on all of the heads. But anyway, tonight the tail will be moose, but you can use just about anything, deer, elk. We've even used paintbrush bristles and they work just fine. And the body is going to be thread or floss based on the hook size. Wings are elk, deer, calf, moose, whatever. Tonight we'll be using deer, but we're going to show you some elk and then explain to you why we won't be using that. The hump is going to be deer or elk or moose. And in fact, I'll use elk tonight. The hackle is grizzly, but it can be whatever's laying on your tying desk. And in fact, I've got one special feather laying here that will give us two colors out of one. So anyway, before we get into the actual uh, presentation, let's take a look at some of the expectations and some of the things that we're going to learn. Because tonight, our objectives are additional material purpose. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, that means that we have every part of the fly on a humpy. It has to do one function. Let's say, for an example, you're putting on hair for the wings. It also has to serve another function. Let's say you're putting on the tail. Well, once the tail is constructed, you've got waste material and it's going to serve another function as well. Second item, material creep and the first rule. The humpy is one of those flies that when you start to tie it, if you stop and go get a cup of coffee and you come back, you'll find the whole darn thing is worked forward on the hook. And when you go to finish the fly, there's no room left for the hackle. We're going to show you how to, how to compensate for that. And the last item is 70% materials and 30% skill. Now, I know there's people that would probably disagree with this, but we've learned that if you don't have the right material in tying any hair wing fly, but especially the humpy, you're having a really difficult time. There's less skill involved unless it's a, a skill required to select materials. And that's where we're going to go right now is materials. And the main material in a humpy is hair. And we're going to have a crash course tonight on hair. To the materials. And as you can see here, I've got a few items over here. Static guard. Everything's been hosed down with static guard to take away the static electricity. Poly yarn, hooks. I've got hackle already sized. I'll just lay that over there at the vise. Let's see. Right there it goes. We've got our, our thread, and I'll set that over there as well. Thread, oh, by the way, it's a thread here, floss here, same color. So when we switch, you won't, you won't notice it, but we'll get that there. All right, now we've got hair. And boy, do we have hair. We're going to start with this hair right here. And this has got a problem. And we're just going to use this hair as a demonstration piece of hair only, which will allow you to fix hair that maybe isn't the very best. That's all this is going to do tonight. I, I normally use it for something else, but it's got kind of a crooked spot right here. 
and we're going to show you how to take care of that. I'll set that over at the vise as well. All right, we've got the deer hair. Two pieces of deer, I'll just set that aside. We've got three pieces of elk, and we have some moose. Let's take a look at a couple of pictures of, um, of the hides. This is a white-tailed deer hide. Many of you have already seen this. And here's one of a, of a bull elk. Maybe a few of you haven't seen that particular one. We haven't talked about that too much. But one of the things that you want in, a, in any hair wing fly, if it's a dry fly, is you want to take the hair along the backbone, down over the shoulder, down over the rump, that dark strip down through there is a, has less flare to it and makes a lot better wing and tail. On the other side, you've got an elk, hair, elk, elk hide here. Same thing applies down the middle. But I want you to notice we've got some really dark stuff up here and that's the elk mane. We're not gonna deal with that too much other than use it as an illustration on the, what I showed you just a moment ago. It'll be just a sec. But I want you to notice this dark stuff here. I call this area the drip line. So let's, let's start with the hair along the back. It's dark, it's dense, and I think its purpose is probably to shed water off the back of the animal. And as it starts down the animal's side towards the belly, when it gets to the point where the hair starts to go under the belly, there's a line all along there, on an, especially on an elk. And the hair is very different there. And I think its only purpose is basically to wick away water uh, rather than have it run down into the belly area. We're going to take a good hard look at that because it's got a use, but it's not without some problems. Let me set those aside for a moment. Right now, the first thing I'm going to do is go over to the to the vise. And uh, Gretchen, why don't you talk about why don't, oh, you, why don't okay. you talk about books while I get my glasses we'll changed? Take a I commercial break here. Yeah, huh? Take a commercial break. <clears throat> well, we've got books, as you know, and uh, this is our current current listing of books. They're available on Amazon as a hard copy or as an ebook. You can get them, and we also keep a few on hand, so you can get them through us if you go to albd2 at gmail.com. Take a piece of this hair out and just get a get a bundle of that. Get my scissors and cut it off. Because this is a common problem you're going to find no matter where you get your hair. Sometimes it's got a cowlick in it, a curve. Um, it just can cause you all kinds of trouble. And I want you to see that this one has a bend that kind of goes to the right. There's a couple of the hairs got twisted around. I'll just throw them away. We got a, we've got a bend in this hair. Yeah. There we go. Okay, there you can see it now. I got it. It's kind of hard to hold it at the angle for the camera. Well, there's, if you stack that and try to make a tail out of it or whatever application you're going to do, the darn stuff just doesn't make a good looking tail if the hair isn't straight. It doesn't stack up real good. Well, there's a way to straighten that. And we're going to do that mechanically. Now, any of you salmon fly tires will recognize this trick as a way of shaping your crest feathers for an Atlantic salmon fly. And all we're gonna do is place a series of crimps along the outside of the bend with our thumbnail and our forefinger like this. Okay, and, and every now and then there'll be one hair that gets too much. Now I want you to notice how, how much that has been straightened out except this one hair clear out on the end here that I'm gonna get rid of. But the rest of them have been straightened out quite a bit. And I'm going to throw that away because the only thing I use this particular clump of hair for is weaving hackles for the Franz pot flies. We'll do that later down the road, but that's not going to be tonight. Let me just set that over there. And let's take a look at real hair and some of the things that we're going to run into with that. Because if you don't have the hair that we talked about, go back to the materials. There we go. We've got, remember over here on our deer hide that we were talking about the dark down the backbone? Well, and then it gets down into the lighter into the rib area. And you notice the drip line on a deer is white. Hair on, on the deer 
um, is the same as what we're going to look at here on an elk as far as the way it's shaped and everything, but the elk shows it just as well. So here's examples of the actual hair. Left hand is holding from the, from the backbone area. There is a space missing here. I gave some to a friend. I should have kept it so I'd have a better illustration. But anyway, there's a space of about the amount that I'm holding right here between the two that goes right in this area. And then it picks up. And I want you to notice that it's really dark here. And as we travel down, the darkness starts going away until we get into the really light stuff. Well, the really light stuff is great for spinning, but you need that dark hair, the density of the dark hair, because it won't flare nearly as much and it makes really nice wings and tails. Now, set that aside. You'll be using this for wings and tails today. I'm gonna to be tying a size 10. So I need a piece of hair that has quite a bit of dark in it. However, if I'm tying 16s and 18s, there's a lot of pretty good stuff right down in the tip of this hair. And that's all you're gonna be using if you're tying a 16 or an 18. So you can get by with some of that, with that kind of hair based on the size of fly you're tying. Now I'm gonna set this aside for a moment. Now this is elk from the backbone, from the lower rib area, and you can see the drip line starting to show up right here. And this hair here is from higher up on the, on the same hide. And there's again, another piece missing. But as you can see, that kind of, kind of blends together going, going on down in. Let's take a close up look at these hairs and the, and the properties they have and why some are better for some things than other things. Let's get back over here to the, to the vise. And I'm gonna start with a close up look at the deer backbone hair, dark backbone hair. And what we're looking at here is just a clump that, I, that I've cut off. And I want you to notice, well, let me take a tighter shot here. All right. I want you to see there what, what we have going on. We've got a really sharp, dark point, a tan little strip, and then it's dark again until it starts working its way down the hair and we get towards the base end and it starts to get to, to the lighter gray. I want you to notice that fine tip on that, on that one right there and these others. We're going to talk later about layers of hair and I want you to notice the, maybe I can pull it apart a little bit better. I want you to notice the little guys in there, just below, just below the longest ones. We've talked in the past about the really long stuff, layers one, that really long one there, layer two right there. And if you're gonna be successful in tying humpies anyway, or wolves, you throw everything else away. Because even though that hair looks very, very similar, its properties are very different. I don't know if you can see that or not. It's a, it, it sticks out to me, but I've only had 65 years of doing it. So I kind of have an idea what I'm looking for. But those shorter ones in there, they're colored similarly, but the, the base ends are very, very different. Their properties flare, even the tip ends flare quite a bit. I'll set that aside for a moment because I want you to see what the hair looks like as we get further into the belly area. Same animal, I just showed you that a minute ago. We'll bring this up here. And now you can see we still got those, those really dark tips going to a right, uh, the, the tan um, strip right below that. And then it goes right into the light gray stuff. The only part that would be worth anything for on this particular bundle of hair is if you were gonna tie a wing and a tail on a, probably about an 18, because it's only this little stuff right out here that where my fingernail is pointing that is going to be the best. And uh, maybe some of the tan stuff will be okay. But I, this really shows up quite well, layers three, four, five, and six. We've talked about those layers before. And I want you to notice the density and size of layers one and two and the small, the smaller uh, diameter, I guess you would say, of that layers three and four, the stuff you want to get rid of. And that really shows up there. But let me set that aside. 
Okay, this is elk backbone hair. We will not be using the elk backbone hair tonight. And I'll show you why. In fact, take a really good close look there. That's just a typical elk backbone hair. I don't know what it is about the stuff, but the tips break like a son of a gun. And yeah, you can use it. And if you're just dying your own fish and flies, you'll have just a, a fine time, no problem. But I want you to notice that, that my old buddy, Dave Corcoran, who was, would have turned all my flies back and says, I don't want these if they would have all had wings made that looked like that. So tonight we will not be using elk on the wing. We'll be using deer. Now let's take a look at the rib, the rib hair on that elk. There we go. You can see you've got the sharp tip just like you do with the deer. Goes into tan straight into the lighter stuff. And uh, again, that spins really good. Or we have another use for it on the humpy tonight. We'll be using this particular kind of hair in the hump itself. But anyway, there's that. But let's get to the darker hair down in the down into the drip line, as I call it, the lower belly, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I want you to notice the hair is a really dense, a long, the the tip, the dark tip part, if you will, is it goes for a, a half an inch before it gets into that tan band that we have on some of the others. Well, the problem with this is I want you to notice, again, notice all the broken tips. That's because the denseness of the dark hair is somewhat brittle and breaks off a lot of stuff. And this is a long skinny tip on these and that's why they'll break off real easy. In fact, just to kind of give you an idea, let's take a, well, let's take a, a quick close-up look here. Right now I'm just holding this bodkin up. Pretend Christmas is coming, guys. Bear with me. Pretend that this is a, a candy cane stick. You could take and break that real easy just by doing that. Because you could be putting pressure in the middle and pry down, and it would break that candy cane stick. However, if you went and move to there and try to break it right in the middle of there, it would be a lot harder to break because you don't have the same torque on that short piece that you do on the long piece. Now, that may be a very poor description of what, what we're going to be doing, but the reason this hair can be, a, can be such a problem for you is because it's long and brittle. The, the tip is long and brittle and it breaks off real easy. However, when you can get rid of those broken tips and you get those, these long ones like this, this, and this, absolutely incredible tail material when you're tying 16, 18s, and 20s, especially 18s and 20s. So whatever, whatever that's worth. Um, so that, that lower belly drip hair, whatever you want to call it, is uh, really good stuff if you're tying very small stuff. Okay, now here is that, that same area, but it, right next to it, Right below the drip area of, of really dark, you've got this white stuff. Notice that the hair is the same shape, long and skinny tips. Where's the broken tips? Almost no broken tips in there. Why is that? Because this hair is less brittle is the only thing I can come up with for an explanation. It's less brittle because it's not dark, it's light. It's got a lot of flareability and it's got, that's got something to do with it. Now, we're gonna talk about material creep. And because of that, now you, you already know that we start our thread and use it as a delineation marker between different parts of the fly. And that would be the point where I would want to have my wings. Eric wants to know about badger to guard here as a sub. Okay, uh, Eric, uh, asked about badger guard hair as a sub. There is a bunch of hair out there that's really good. Badger is one of the ones that's, that's really good. I'll show you one of the things is when we get to the tail that you would need to do with badger or you'd have to have one heck of a lot of badger, one of the two. But I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take up your question in just a moment here. The hair works great. The, dense, the, 
It's not very big around, so it takes an awful lot of hair to make a properly proportioned tail that will support the hump, or we'll show you the trick to not have to do that. Let's see, I'm gonna start in the middle though, instead of where I normally would, this would be the place that would mark where my wing would go. Well, the one thing about a humpy, the rule of two turns that we talked about way back at the beginning, if you think you're in the right spot on a humpy, back up two turns. Because that little fellow, when you go to get a cup of coffee, is going to move forward on the hook. And I'll show you how that happens. Let me just get a, a piece of moose hair out here. I didn't take a good look at the moose hair, because we'll do that when we go to stack it. What, how do you separate the bad tips from the good tips? Uh, it, how do I do that? I stack it, fan it out, and only you'll, I'll show you here in just a minute. I'll, I'll, if I can't, if I don't come up with some bad tips, I'll make sure I have a clump of hair with bad tips. Let's see that right there. Sometimes I use tweezers, so I yeah. fan it out and we use tweezers. Use tweezers to pick all it out. the time to do that. Yes, absolutely. That's the wing. I had all this extra laying out, and I have to get down to what I really need now. The way you cut your hair off the hide is really, really important. Number one, I want you to notice that you, my hide is just laying here, and I'll reach in with my scissor points and pry up about the amount of hair that I need to do the job. I grab a hold of the hair. Let me twist my hand around here so you can. And then I, I drive the scissors down tight against the hide. That's the reason I have all these cut things here. I have a short stubble field is what I call it. If you're not careful, if you come in like this to cut your hair, you end up with a long stubble field. And pretty soon that stubble field is running into the hair you're trying to cut out, drive you nuts. Just word to the wise, you can do whatever you want, but that's just one way to get around it. Let me get this, this moose out of here. And we've got a lot of fuzz and all that kind of stuff I need to get rid of. I'm gonna do that over the waste can um, before I meet you back over at the vice. So I'm gonna be off camera for just a moment. Okay, what I did off camera is, um, is I rapidly ran my finger up and down through the waste ends here, and it took all the fuzz fur and short fibers out. The only thing that's left now is layers one and two, and maybe one or two hairs down in there from layers three. Again, remember the layers three, four, five, and six, and all the fuzz don't do you any good. I'm gonna slip that into my stacker backwards. And yes, you all know about my stacker. It's a homemade stacker, been with me for 40 years. I love that darn thing. I'm not gonna get rid of it. Yep. I sell the darn things, but. Yes, 24 of them actually. Yeah, I, yeah, 24 of them sitting right here. So you but, can do a dozen wings and a dozen tails. Yeah. Okay, now, Eric, we're gonna get to your question here in just a moment. Typically, when you're using moose for the tail, you want a tail that once when twisted and compared to the outside diameter of the hook eye, that they'll be about the same size. One overhand twist compared to the hook eye should be about the same size. Well, you asked the question about using badger. Often in something like badger, it takes so much hair because the, the size of the hair, the bigness around the circumference, whatever you want to call it, is so much less than something like moose that it takes quite a bit of hair to make that to make that happen. You're gonna end up with something that's a lot less, more slender. So I'm gonna pretend that this is uh, now some badger. I threw away part of it. We'll set it in place and tie it down. <clears throat> Now, the one thing I wanted to show you, I made a mistake and I did it on purpose because I wanted to show you and then we'll come back and do this over. I'm going to cut this off just as close as I can. Remember that was that thread was in the middle of the hook. And I want you to notice that the stubs have already moved forward almost the width of two turns. Right there. You can see that sticking out. Let me move. See those black stubs sticking out there? Now that moves it forward and everything moves forward. And then the next bundle of hair doing whatever it does will move forward because I didn't back up the two thread turns. So now I'm going to back up 
get myself another bundle of hair, but I'll do the same thing uh, that I talked about, Eric. But the thing you always do is I wanted my hair stubs to be there in the center of the hook. Remember, if, you, if you're where you think you want to be, back up two turns. Okay. Now, when I trim those hair stubs, they're, they'll be laying right on that center mark. You can just stay right there. I'm going to pop off camera for just a moment, folks. Get a quick bundle of moose hair, clean the fibers out of the tail, and I'll be back at the vise here in just a second. And as you can see, I've got most of the fuzz and stuff out. Let's make sure that every, the only thing that's left is layers one and two. That looks good. Yep, they're all gone. But I, what you do to get rid of that is if you grab your bundle of hair here in the middle and, and try to pull the fibers and stuff out, you'll only get some of the fuzz and a lot of three and four is gonna be left there. What you do is you grab clear out on the tip end. See where I'm grabbing that? Maybe I can, let's see, there we go. There, okay, that's where you grab it. And then you grab in and you pull everything else out because you're getting rid of everything except layers one and two. Okay, and I always back the hair into the stacker rather than try to put the tips in. And why is that? Can I tell you how many times I've seen people trying to line those unstacked tips up with the stacker and can't get them to go in? Well, the, the stuff you cut off the hide is all even. Okay, I want you to notice that I took the hair out pointing in the direction I'm going to use it. We may as well go into this right now so I don't have to do it again later. If you're doing tails, <clears throat> always turn your stacker in the direction the hair goes on the hook. If you're doing wings, do the same thing. Let's pretend that that is, that is hair for wings. Turn it in that direction. Cannot tell you how many times I've seen people always take the hair out of the same way. They take it out of the stacker with the same, same hand, hold the stacker in the right hand, and then they say, oh darn, that was supposed to be a wing. Then they do this routine. They try to take another finger and hold it there and turn it around without messing it up. And they get, can get pretty good at turning it around without messing it up. But you could just turn the stacker in the way it needs to go. Okay, Eric, for you, I'm going to get rid of some of this bundle of hair. And then I'll show you how to compensate. Okay, that's just about the right amount if we were doing a standard moose tail. Yep, that's just about right. Twist over about the same diameter as the outside diameter of the hook eye. Let me get rid of part of that. Any other questions before we before we continue? Okay, that's about half of what we wanted. I'll just measure it for length equal to the length of the hook shank, set it in place. I want you to notice that as I tie that down, that when I trim that, let me let me let me zoom in here. If I were to trim that, those butts would fall right smack on that half on that halfway point. So let's back up. But I'm not going to trim it because Eric has asked me to pretend I'm I'm working with uh, with Badger, and so with Badger, you're going to have to compensate a, a bit for the fact that we don't have as much hair there. And remember, I told you that each material had to perform more than one function. They do, and part of it is building that hump. And so we're gonna start by pulling, oops, hit, quit hitting the camera, pulling that over, binding the hair down, and now I'm gonna advance my thread forward to the one third point. That's where I want my wings to be. But remember what I said? If I'm where I wanna be, I gotta back up two turns. There, now I'll tie that on because the bulk of my hair when I tie on the wing material will actually end up on that one third position. Now I'm gonna get over here and get a bundle of this backbone hair from the deer. And again, just like I did with the moose, I put the scissors in there, tilt up the amount that I want, reach in, cut it off. When I hold on to that layers one and two, notice when I pry down all that layers three, four and fuzz and crap that sticks up there, that's what we wanna get rid of. 
And had I grabbed that bundle in the middle, like most people do, I would have been keeping a whole bunch of stuff I don't want. And I would, would have only been getting rid of layers maybe five and six. So I'm going to go off camera right now and get rid of all that junk. It's right there uh, sticking out from between my fingers. Now you'll see that it's mostly gone. And if I do the same thing I did before, oh, there's one or two that's left there instead of the many, many that were there. So anyway, now remember, this is all should be fairly even. So when I take my hair stacker and back it in, I don't have to worry about trying to line those uneven tips up, getting it into my stacker. Now, <clears throat> all right. You can really see the uh, tips, the light band, and then the darker as it goes down towards the lighter gray towards the butt ends. So that's a, a really good shot right there. Of what you're looking for in the fly shop is you're looking for the good tips, the band right under it, and then the darker going for at least half the length of the, of the, of the hair fiber. Now, I've had people ask me, you only use whitetail deer for your for your hair wing flies. What about mule deer? I've got to tell you the thing about mule deer that I don't like, the hair is fine, but you see this tart tan band right here? The Each hair, that little piece of band is not always in the same place. It kind of bounces around. I don't know what the deal is, but it, it's more of a modeled effect when you tie your wing on rather than an even division of dark tips, band, and then gradually fading into the darker gray. So that's why I don't use mule deer. Not a thing wrong with it, good hair. It just doesn't give me the good clean lines that I want on the flies that we tie. So we're gonna measure this for length now. Length of the hook shank, set it in place down on my side of the hook, take a turn around and just tighten up and roll it up into place. I'm really bailing into that right there. See, because it flares anyway, even though it's that darker hair. All right, now we're at a, at a critical point here because normally you'd try to cut this off even and smooth everything out so that the wing and the tail made a nice underbody so that when you put the dubbing on your fly, you would um, have a nice smooth body and you get a nice smooth body by having a good underbody. Well, what we're going to do now, I'm going to make an absolute mess and then fix it later. We're going to form part of our hump. First off, we form, form, form part of the hump out of the tail by folding it over. You can see that right there. We're going to make some more of the hump out of the waist from the wing. And then we'll cover it all up. And I'll show you how it all comes together here. So I'm wrapping back up and over. Okay, and right about there, I'm going to quit and come back to the center, back up to the front. And I'm going to cut this off. Normally, we try to cut and blend everything. I want this just to be a big gobby chop off, just like I'm doing right there. Now, I'll get over to the other side and get it because I didn't do a good job. Of, there we go. All right. Now, I'll unwind and go back to where I was. I just wanted to get my temporarily get my floss out of the way. Okay, now the material creep that we, we run into often is um, I'm going to use some of this. First off, I'm going to use some of this really long and fuzzy um, rib hair from an elk. It flares like crazy for years. I would get rid of this stuff because I couldn't figure out what to do with it until I learned to, to tie use it for the, the hump on my humpies. But one of the, notice that I've already made half of the hump out of the waist from the tail and the waist from the wing. So I don't need near as much of this. And it's a lot easier. This stuff is hard to control. And it's a lot easier to control when you have a smaller amount. So I'm going to get rid of all the waste and short hairs and all that stuff. Though I don't really care so much about layers 
three and four and all that stuff. I just want stuff long enough to do the job because it's all going to be chopped off anyway. Let me move off camera for a moment. Now I've got a little bit too much hair here. And the only way I can tell you is that experience will tell you how much you need. Or you can use the pinch method. Normally, I would want a bundle of hair for a hump that would be about equal to the width of the gap of the hook after I've done the gathering process. And we've done this before, uh, but I'll go through it again for those of you that haven't seen it. The gathering process. I'm holding this with my left hand. I reach in from the opposite direction and grab it with my right. Grab, 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 pinch. Grab, 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 pinch. And when I pinch down on that, how, how wide is that? And that's a little bit less than the gap of the hook. And that's about what I want because I would, would normally have the gap of the hook. Now I'm going to cut this even, but move off camera so I don't get it all over the lens. Now, what I'm doing is I'm setting it in, not here behind the wing where you think you would, but in the exact center where that big hump is that I've already built up from the waist, from the tail and from the wings. Now, if I pull down with my thread that close to the end of those butts, it'll slip right off. So when I pull down, I also pull back. See how I'm pulling back? You see how that just cinches right into there? Had I not done that, it would have slipped off and then I would have had to retrim it. Let me do it over because in describing it to you, I managed to slip it. So let me cut it off again, set it in place, Pull down and back, there we go. And now I'm gonna start wrapping towards the back of the hook. And now I'm just gonna come, come back filling in to make the hump of my humpy. Make sure this back part back here gets blended in so it's a nice, even climb the hill to the center of the body and then come down the hill to the front. Now here's where people make mistakes big time. Remember I told you, if you think you're in the right spot, back up two turns. Well, where is the right spot? Let's, let's identify that. Because most people would pull the hump over and tie it right in behind the, the back of the wing. And then you're, that's a mistake in the first place. First off, you need to have some room back there for hackle. So that's the room I just took off for the hackle. Now I'm gonna back up a little bit more so that I'm back probably a good three or four turns from the back of the wing. So that when I pull this over to make the hump, I'm gonna leave myself space for the hackle later. And I'm gonna just kind of dress this up and pull it over. And I'll tell you right now, I can pull on that hair forever. And right now that's pretty good. That's pretty tight. Most people would say that's good enough. I'm gonna give you a rule right now in tying humpies, you can't pull the hair tight enough. You have to push it tight. And how do I do that? Well, I kind of get things laying the way I want them. And I'll take this finger right here and push at the base and then slide forward, just like that. I'm exaggerating the point right now. So I'm gonna push there. And as I push forward, I'll relax my right hand, take the thumb, push, Now I'll take a couple of wraps around. <clears throat> now here's where it's a really important step is I will relax the thread tension, pull up, and then holding tension on the, on the hair itself, the hair tips, I'll pull down. What that does is that forces that hair on top of the body Guarantee, I don't even have to look, but I'll twist this over there and you see, you've got just the body showing through. Had I not done that pull up and cinch it down while under pressure, uh, I would more than likely had thread torque repositioning some of my hump hair down on probably the offside. Now, here's the next place for, for making a mistake. And that is, you'd think to yourself, dang, 
I'd better cut that off short because um, I just better cut it off short, short so it doesn't show. And what happens is you cut it off short and there ain't enough crazy glue in the world to keep those darn things from popping out from under that thread. You don't do that. <clears throat> I'm going to exaggerate the point. We're going to cut this off extra long. See how long that stuff is? Let me, there you, there you can get an idea. And I can zoom in real quick. See how long I cut that off? That way it's not going to be pulling out when I when I do go to work later. But right now it's time to switch, to switch my floss, get rid of the floss and go to thread. Now, if this is a size 14, then I would be using thread all the way through the same color from Danville. But this is 6.0 and I would be using that to, to tie the fly all the way from start to finish. But as it is, I'm just gonna switch now to the thread and get rid of the floss. Okay, trim off the waist, set the, set the floss aside. <clears throat> okay, now I need to divide the wings. I want you to also notice that the waist from the, from the, from the uh, from the hump is there as well. Well, I'm going to try to divide those wings as close to the center as I can get them. And at the same time, I'm reaching through and spreading the waste from the hump. Because when I crisscross between, I want to capture the waste from the hump just like I captured the wing material. So what I'm doing is, let me take another turn this way and another turn this way, because what I'm doing is actually capturing the butt ends of the hump into the bottom end of the wing, if you will. And when I bundle, bundle my wing, I call it uh, posting the wing, I will be capturing the, the hair from the hump into the wing. So it really strengthens the whole operation. So let me, now you're not going to be able to see this. You're going to have to take my word for it, but I'm going to do the offside one first and capture as much of that hair into the waist, or the bottom, not the waist, but the bottom of the wing. The waist from the hump goes into the bottom of the wing. And I, it's one of the things I won't be able to do is show you on that offside, but I can probably show you on the near side by turning it like that and wrapping and capturing the waist from the hump into the base end of that wing. I want you to notice that I needed to pull some slack. And what I did not do is I did not pull on my posted wing, which I just pulled it all off, did that on purpose just to show you, is I took a loop around the hook to give me an anchor point to pull. So let me go back around that um, base of that wing, capturing the waist from the hump. Now I'm going to go around my hook, take a look, hook around, pull my thread out, back up. What that allows me to do then is continue wrapping with snug but not tight wraps up that waist from the hump. And you can see now that we're getting a pretty good capture of all of those waste fibers there. The hackle will cover most of that. And especially after I crisscross between those wings several times. And there we go. Now, so we've got the, the body basically done, ready to do our hackle. I'm going to do something I've never done before. Back in the day when I was working for Tom Whiting and Whiting Farms, he bought a line of birds to, uh, from a, a Michigan hackle grower by the name of Ted Hebert. A lot of people have heard of Hebert Hackle and some 
incredible colored birds. And but anyway, Tom got that line. But one of the things that Hebert did not have in his bird line was grizzly. He had some of the most gorgeous speckled colors that you can imagine, but none of it was grizzly. So we had to introduce grizzly into that line. And in the process, some of the first generations where it was feathers, they didn't know what the heck it wanted to be. It didn't know whether it wanted to be brown, badger, grizzly, or what the heck. Well, I'm going to tie a mixed hackle fly by um, using a two colored feather. I just had this wild thought as I was getting hackle out today. I said, well, I'll be darn. I've never done that before. Let's give it a try. So I'm just going to tie this on at the front. And I know everybody's starting to say, oh no, Al's gonna talk about crisscross wraps now. Well, you're right, I am. You're gonna be so sick of crisscross wraps by the end of the year that you'll never wanna hear about them again. But you'll also have realized just how much they are a real asset Real trick in your fly tying in your fly tying bag. Okay, now I've got that feather tied on. It's at the front. I want you to notice too that I left some space here to, to tie off my last turn of hackle and to build a head. All right. And we're going to start wrapping at the front here, working our way back with the brown. Actually, it's a badge. Kind of a gingery badger, but okay. The first turn behind the wings, and now the grizzly is coming into play, and we'll bring the grizzly forward. I'm crisscrossing over, and you think those crisscross wraps are going to make each other stronger? They sure are. Now I'm going to pull that up straight and take a turn around, a second turn. And it sets us up for uh, a, good, a good head on our fly. I'll take one more turn because I've got the space there. Now, here's where you can make a mistake. See it happen all the time. Fly tires get to the point and they say, oh darn, I sure don't want that to come apart. I better put some more wraps of thread on that, hold that feather to keep it from coming undone. So they put on, I did number three, number four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 16, 18, 20. Well, 20 turns will hold it. Well, then they cut off the feather. They got to cover up that feather and they end up with a really good looking fly and a big lopsided hit. You don't want to do that. Back up. There's two turns holding that right there. Now I'm going to, now remember we're anchored the feather this way the way my scissors are pointing. Now I'm going to jam the feather back and wrap a thread head in a jam knot in front that jams that feather back and dog legs it. And each turn of thread, starting at the hook eye and working my way back. And I want you to notice, see how that, how that feather kicks back into that hackle? And now we're going to do a good whip. I want you to notice that when we built our thread head the way we did, the wraps of thread, let me just make sure that I got them. Okay, they're still hanging there at the back. The wraps of thread started at the hook eye as I built the jam knot and it continued going back like my pointer is doing and pushing the hackle back. So I'm accomplishing a couple things. I'm dog legging the hackle, making it more durable and I'm setting myself up for a good whip. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start with my turns at the, at the back of the head, subsequent turns forward. I'll put my whip finish tool away, use the notch in my scissors just to break the thread. Now to break the hackle, with that same notch. Uh, 
And there we've got a we've got a humpy. Yeah. Jay Lee uh, wants to know about tying humpy with one bunch of hair. With one, but oh, one bunch of hair. Yep, I can do that. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, Jay, and uh, that's also in the book, and uh, it's a, a lot easier to do. But one the 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 reason I don't do too many of them is that because most people want a very definite color. To the body you see you can see really see the orange of the body now i'm going to go ahead and tie the same thing um and with one with one bundle of hair and we're going to uh, uh see the difference in the body and it's not a lot but uh, some people find it objectionable i'll set this aside and that, that's what we call the fold over method jay and for those of you who don't know, Jay is joining us from the Netherlands. And it's in the middle of the doggone night for him over there. It's uh, somewhere around uh, um, two, three o'clock in the morning. So I'm gonna get some uh, a bundle of uh, moose hair and you already know how I do that. So we don't need to worry about that. I'm gonna grab it right out here on the tips like I talked about before. And then Rapidly run my finger up and down through the waist to the butt ends to get rid of the waist and the in layers. I want you to notice so I'm still in the middle of the hook. And my thread is two turns shy of the center. Because the same problem with whether you're at the fold over humpy or whether it's a, the, the three material humpy, it's still it creeps forward on the hook if you're not looking. And one of the things that I really need to make sure of is that I got my tail right, because if I didn't get the tail right, it'll screw up all every all the measurements from here forward. So the tail must be the same length as the hook shape. And here's a hook I've got for the next fly. So I'll just do a quick measurement here. And that looks to me like it's pretty close to the shank of the hook. Only I'm going to use some of that rib. That rib, rib kind of hair. Quite frankly, Jay, I haven't done one of these in so long. I don't even know if I still can. <laughs> I'll probably figure it out. Oh, I think you'll figure it out. Yeah. So that I can get the wing and the hump shaped out of the piece, same piece of hair. <clears throat> so how do you do that? Well, You can use the uh, little gauge that I started out with years and years ago, or you can hold it up here like this. Make sure that the wing is in, and the tail are, are even with each other. Trim off even with the front of the hook. Set this in the center. Tighten up and start wrapping towards the back of the hook. All right, now I'm just gonna move forward. And remember, I want the wings to set at the one third position. So after I get in front of all the trimmed off stuff, Guess where my thread ends up? Right there. I'll pull this up and over, pull it forward. Remember, you can't pull hump hair tight. You have to push it tight. Try that again, still not good.
hold it, grab a hold of the wings, pull up. Remember, you got to pull up and tighten them under tension. All right, now, <clears throat> now I'll switch to thread from floss. Had I been doing a size 14 um, or smaller, it would be all size 60 thread. All right, I'll wrap a little bit of a thread dam in front of those wings to stand them up. All right, and now we'll take a look at the back there and divide those wings. And I'll wrap around that wing. Again, all I'm doing is gathering the wing. It's what I call posting the wing. You'll find that in our book that we refer to posting, posting the wing. And all we're doing is wrapping thread base around the bundle to gather it. And let's make sure I haven't misjudged the size. That looks pretty good. Give myself room to make a head. Now I want you to notice when I bring this hackle forward, because I didn't wrap at the front to the back and back forward again, I'm ja jamming this hackle really back hard so I don't have a space under the off wing. If you don't do that, you'll have a little, little slot into that off wing. Okay, uh, you're, I don't need to go through all the other stuff. You know why we're going to build the head way, the way we are. Use the, the V of the scissors to get rid of the... The V to cut the, th the thread. Set my wings up the way I want them. And there you go. But I want you to notice that the body itself, the profile there, is a little bit more slender. It doesn't show through quite as much. And the fish will see a little stripe of white or whatever color of hair you've got down, down the side. And I'll get my <clears throat> my thread. And again, I'm going to my, my floss this time. I'm sorry, floss. I'll start it in the center, wrap to the end of the shank, and back until I get two thread turns shy of the middle. <clears throat> Moose hair is so easy to use for a tail, too. Moose hair is wonderful stuff. When just, I just, teach beginners, I always try to get them to use moose hair yeah. for tails. Yeah, in fact, you can you can see that it's good, fine tips. And if you get a decent, decent piece of moose, no broken tips, it supports the fly well. And it's really easy to identify layers one and two and get rid of all this other junk. And I'll get over the waste bin to do that. And all I'm doing is just building up, trim off the waist. And rem remember now, you can see that uh, when I trim that, that waist will land right on that uh, 
that spot right there. <clears throat> now, the stuff that I'm going to use for this one is called poly yarn, Fen Tex poly yarn. You can get it to, well, many of you have already seen us using this stuff uh, over the years. I'll just cut a piece of that yarn off. And I want you to see that there's some, some uh, snags and snarls and all that type of stuff. And you'll need to work the, those snags and snarls out. One way to do it is with your scissor point. That works pretty good. I've already combed some out in the interest of saving some time. And I'll just uh, take and double this over. Cut that. Need a band aid. Mm? Need a band aid. Mm. And I'll just tie that on. You're bleeding. Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I'm no, I that's dye. I'm coloring the fly. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. You know, you were we were talking about presentations and things going to hell. Well, you just saw it. Anyway, forget the blood, guys. If it if it bothers you, maybe go ahead and sign off. And I'm just going to go ahead and pull this over just like we did the, the pullover hair one that we did for Jay Lee out of hair. Okay, yeah, that's looking pretty good. And uh, I'll have to find a, a hackle. Let me let me pause for a moment to take a drink of coffee and to uh, have the medic take care of me for a moment. <laughs> yeah, I, or the fly. That, that's that's dye, Gretchen. Don't tell them it's blood. It's, tell them it's, it's it's red dye. We decided to color it red. You can call the fly the bloody humpy. Hey, that's a great. You know what? That would be called that would be called chumming, wouldn't it? If I were to use a bloody fly like that. And I'm still using floss, you notice. Well, with this one, I mean, this is a fishing fly. We're not going to worry about the size of the head and all that stuff. And I'll still be able to keep the size of the head pretty nice. Now, one of the things that I want to do is cut my wings to length, but do not pull tight like I'm doing here to cut the wing because it'll spring back and you'll lose about 10%. So what you do is you pull it up tight, relax, and cut your wing to length. Now I'll wrap the hackle. Remember, we got to jam that feather tight back in back in this offside over here. And I want you to notice that I did not bother to to divide the wings. When you're going fishing, you don't need to really worry too much about that. Two turns, pull this back to build a, a head. And remember, I'm doing this with floss, so I'm going to use less turns. Get my whip finish tool. I want to show you something about whip finishing. A lot of people do that make this mistake. See how close the tool is? There, I have absolutely no room to work this around. What you want to do is give yourself some space. See how now you see you can't even let me go behind. You can look back here and see that I probably have an inch or more between my tool. It gives me room to maneuver. So even with floss, you can make a pretty decent head. And there's a humpy that 
I use for fishing, except I without the red dye. 